thanks to all of you for coming. It's uh, really an honor to be at such a at such a place, and uh, uh, and you know it's a scary place. Okay, so um, you know I met a lot of people. I already knew a lot of people here, and. I think that's one of the most kind of, uh, you know, a real privilege to, to get to do something like this. And when something like this is coming up, I try to exploit it by, uh, you know, thinking ahead, uh, you know, anticipating, oh my God, these people are big and scary and, uh, uh, and I got to say something, something good. Uh, so now this is, this is what's in my, uh, in the title and I, I intend to deliver on this, but um, in thinking about the talk um, and trying to anticipate it and say something different, um, I, I thought I would spend a little time first talking about what turns out to be the 40 years that I've been working uh, on manipulation. And in fact, it was only as in preparing for this, suddenly I realized that, um, that it is 40 years. So I started in graduate school. I started in graduate school in 1976. When I started, I was actually an, an old-fashioned AI guy. I was working on common sense reasoning for Jerry Sussman. I had done a bachelor's thesis on qualitative simulation of swine production. Okay, uh, it's uh, it's a classic. Uh, someday there will be a citation. I'm I'm confident. Um, and then uh, Jerry Sussman, at some point, he said to me, gee, that didn't really work very well, did it? <laughs> so it's like, poop. Oh, all my friends are doing robotics. I'm out of here. I'm going to do robotics. So uh, my, my office mates were Mark Rayford and John Hollerbach, and uh, Tomas Lozana Perez was in the next lab. And you know, it was an incredible stroke of luck to have landed in that place at that time uh, for me. Uh, Anyway, but it, it's exactly 40 years ago. And, and so what this means is that I've been thinking about the same problem for 40 years. Okay? I, you know, it, it, this sounds, you know, it could be scary or, or not, depending on how you look at it. Um, now, um, when I got to CMU, uh, I got to hang around Alan Newell a little bit. And one of the things that I heard him say occasionally in the, in the corridors uh, just as a, a side note, I, actually, I'm not sure everybody, probably everybody here doesn't know who Alan Newell is, but Newell and Simon and Marvin Minsky and a few others are credited with inventing AI. And so Newell and Simon are the, the CMU guys, and, you know, we named our building after them, and, you know, we have regular ceremonies to worship their, their uh, you know, their memory and so forth. Anyway, but he used to, once in a while, he would say, to be an expert, you have to think about, you have to think about a problem for 10 years. And, I, you know, it sounds too pat to be true, but this has actually now become kind of a current idea. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. It's been in a few popular books recently, including one that, that Malcolm Gladwell wrote. If you chase citations back from Malcolm Gladwell and others, you come to a paper written in 73 uh, by Herb Simon and William Chase, and I think this is you know, maybe the key paper that first uh, broached this idea, they studied chess masters and discovered uh, that their statement of it is that in order to be a chess master, you have to study chess boards for somewhere between 10,000 hours and 50,000 hours. So sometimes this idea is expressed in terms of 10,000 hours, sometimes it's expressed in terms of 10 years. Okay, why am I going on about this? Well, I've been studying the same problem for 40 years, but a year is such an arbitrary number, right? It's just, you know, the amount of time it takes the Earth to go around the sun, what's that got to do with thinking? But this is, uh, this gives you a kind of dimensionless number, right? What's the minimal amount of time to think about something to become an expert? And so the 40 years, you could think of that as being uh, four <laughs> minimally expert units, okay? So here's a more meaningful unit for measuring time. Uh, I have potentially, I say potentially because who knows what I would have done, but, but conceivably I could have become expert in four different areas and I sacrificed that just to keep working manipulation. Okay, so that's a considerable investment, wise or not, and it begs the question, right? If I hadn't written this down, one of you would have, the hand would have shot up instantly and said, okay, well, good is it? What did you learn from four 
what's it called? Minimally expert units. What did I learn about manipulation? Okay, this is it. This is I'm, I'm going to lay it on you. Okay, brace yourself for this deep observation. It's it's really big. Okay, <laughs> manipulation is really big. It's so big, I don't think anybody can comprehend it. Um, what is manipulation? So, and and what does it what does it mean when what, what do I mean when I say it's big? When I started. Um, People were, had this idea that we now call pick and place. And it's a very simple idea. It's so simple, you probably already have it in your heads. Maybe you haven't you know, made it explicit. But, but the idea is, is, is very simple and, and very elegant. And that is you, you, you make a division. So here you have an arm. And think of the arm as a programmable motion device. So you can just tell it where to go, and it goes there. Uh, that's both in position and orientation, six degrees of freedom, right? And then here you have a general purpose grasping device, and whatever you want to pick up, you just aim this thing at it, and you say close, and it closes, and you've got the thing. Okay, now with those two things glued together, then what you can do is you can say, okay, uh, I have a rigid body, it's here, I want it to be there. Okay, I can do that, right? I aim this at that, I say close, and now... This thing is rigidly attached to my programmable motion device, and so I can now move it to wherever I want and say open, and I'm done. And manipulation is solved. Okay? And I'm only exaggerating a little bit to say that you, some people might have thought that when you work out the details of this, that manipulation is solved. Okay, because when you get your head into a certain place, you kind of forget the assumptions that are involved and the things that could go wrong and so forth. But anyway, this was this was for people working in motion planning um, at that time, 78, 79. It seemed like it would be solved. The only thing was you needed to be able to solve the collision avoidance problem. That is, how do I choose a path that gets me from here to there without going through the lectern or you know, or through my face or something like that. And that was a big problem, okay? And then along came Tomas Lozano Perez and uh, Mike Wesley, and they discovered configuration space, which, you know, mechanical engineers have known about for 100 years, but computer scientists didn't, so they reinvented that and turned it into a computational geometry problem, and voila, manipulation was solved, okay? But then, it's not really, okay? Then the next thing is you're like, well... You know, it's not always the case. Uh, sometimes you want to move while in contact with something. Uh, why would you want to do that? Well, if you're putting the cap onto the bottle, right? At that point, you're doing an assembly. And so the cap is moving while constrained by the bottle, right? So you have a kinematic constraint. And in that case, um, you haven't solved the problem because uh, you don't actually want to tell the lid the exact trajectory because you'll get it slightly wrong and you'll end up deserting big forests and breaking the lid or something like that. Okay, so turns out there's like another layer to the onion, which we'll call compliant control or compliant motion. So you see what's going on. Let's see, after, sorry, there are slides. This is, um, here's a figure from the Lozano, Perez, and Wesley paper. You know, here they're saying that these are obstacles and, you know, you need a motion from this point through these obstacles. It's really easy. Um, but even if you have a robot that has some extent, uh, it's still really easy. What you do is you add, or rather subtract, the shape of the robot from these obstacles and you get these transformed obstacles. And now if you plan a path for this point through that, you... You've, you've solved the problem. So that's the C-space idea. And I'm sorry for explaining it. I imagine probably most of the people in the room already know this. But uh, who knows? Maybe not. Um, it's fun with, with these things. Well, anyway, yeah. So, okay, this is the compliant motion thing. So this was my paper from 1981. And I, I didn't invent compliant motion. I'm not going to bother trying and figure out, you know, what... I'm not going to try and explain to you what my contribution was. I probably don't really understand it that well anyway. But, uh, but it's my talk, and so I'm just taking, you know. <laughs> there will be a biased, this is a biased sample of, of robotics research, okay, biased towards my own work. Um, 
that's the compliant motion thing. So, you know, what's happening is, like, you think you've got it, you know, this seemed like a big deal, and then you realize, eh, there's, you know, there's still some more. Dexterous manipulation was a really good one. Um, and uh, I, I, I went through Ken Salisbury's thesis looking for the right picture, and I didn't find the right picture, so I'm just going to demo for you. Um, dexterous manipulation is the idea that if you have... Um, uh, that you can model the contacts between your fingers and this object as uh, kinematic joints. And, uh, and if you do that, then this whole thing might be modeled as a kinematic linkage. And so instead of just treating this as a device that affixes the object to your arm, you can actually get additional controllable degrees of freedom that are the hand. And there might be some many advantages to doing that. So... And if you have nine motors here and three-point contacts there, then you have this thing that he called dexterous manipulation, in-hand manipulation. And uh, there are people in the room that know more about this than I do. I thought I saw Shankar around. Is he around? I saw him earlier. Anyway, you know, if you want to learn about that, uh, maybe Shankar's book is a good place. Uh, so there's dexterous manipulation. Uh, then there's my favorite... Uh, he was so cute. Wasn't he? <laughs> I, I, you know, I was trying to find a really embarrassing photograph, and I'm sorry I failed, but I'm I'm trying to make up for it with some. <laughs> anyway, this is a, an experiment to see if you could control the motion of a body in a tray just by tilting the tray. So it's a very very simple thing. Uh, and uh, Ken did some work on this, and then that, and then he kind of, uh, uh, well, okay, I'm not going to explain Ken's career to you, uh, <laughs> but uh, he's, he's done a few things since then, okay. Uh, dynamic manipulation. This is, uh, you know, the next layer of the onion for me. It's like, well, what else can we do? Gosh, you know, when people put things down, they don't just, you know, it's not like this, right? If you're going to put a magazine on a table, you will toss it, right? You will at least drop it. You may toss it. When you think about the degree of control that people have in their dealing cards, it's quite amazing. Uh, when you pick something up, you don't do this. You might sort of snatch it. And in the beginning, you're using the dynamics of the whole operation to attach the thing to the hand and then following up with fingers, perhaps. And so when you start looking at it, there's lots and lots of things that don't follow this purely kinematic view of of manipulation at all, and uh, this is a, a video that Kevin Lynch produced. By exploiting dynamic forces and allowing relative... Is it okay? The manipulator is a mobile manipulator that uses... Oh, we, we went ahead. <coughs> By exploiting dynamic forces and okay. allowing relative motion... A low degree of freedom robot can control more degrees of freedom of the object. To test our ideas, we are experimenting with a one degree of freedom direct drive arm. Although the arm has only one way. degree That's of freedom, the arm's motion can be varied to control three degrees of freedom of the part in the vertical plane. We have developed an automatic planner that finds manipulator trajectories to perform dynamic tasks while satisfying frictional and dynamic constraints. The following tasks were planned automatically. The arm snatches a block from the table by accelerating into it, so the block moves from rest on the table to rest on the arm. A snatch allows the robot to acquire an object without a gripper. To show that the speed of execution is important, we then execute the same trajectory at two-thirds speed. The first one looked trivial, and then the second one looks pathetic. Right, but no, the trajectory it's not that much is different. executed at one and a half times the speed. By the way, this yellow stuff, very important energy absorbing foam. Here the arm okay. rolls and the object materials on its matter. Note the wind up before the first roll. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead. I think you've you've seen Wait, have you seen it throw the block? No, okay, let it go a little further. 
The goal in the next three examples is to reorient an object by throwing. In the first example, the arm stands the block on end. In this example, the arm stands the block in place. In this last example, the arm first snatches the block, then reorients it by throwing. The throw is planned so, uh, separately and appended to the snatch. So a lot of engineering that went into that, a lot of engineering, a healthy dose of machine learning, optimization, uh, an awesome motor that was given to us by NSK, and then that all-important energy-absorbing foam. <laughs> this is uh, another project. Uh, yeah, so I'm still building it's more manipulator layers manipulator on the onion. That uses its wheels both for locomotion and manipulation. It has four independently driven wheels, none of them steered. The rubber rings on the wheels help grip the paper firmly. We also occasionally add ballast to the robot to reduce slip. The wheels on the paper are called hands, and the wheels on the ground are called feet. The feet work like a two-wheeled differential drive mobile robot, while the hands use a differential drive arrangement to manipulate the paper. For this task, there is no visual feedback, and the robot uses the natural compliance of the paper to make sure the paper is flush against the block. There are lots of other interesting ways to manipulate things. Here, the robot moves the paper by vibrating with an asymmetric vibration. Vibration can also be used to reduce friction between the paper and the desktop, as in this motion. While mobile robots use parallel parking to move themselves sideways, the manipulator uses parallel parking to move the paper sideways. However, since paper is much lighter than a robot, the parallel parking motion can be much faster. So I think it's obvious that this is 1x, but sometimes people ask me, so it is, it is 1x. The robot can also move cylinders if it can get on top of them. In this case, it uses the edge of the table to mount the cylinder. Once on top, the robot is surprisingly stable. So I'm going to move on. Um, the, uh, there's one, oh, I didn't, uh, there's one key phrase that you missed, which is, this is a concept car. There, whenever I would show that demo, there would, there would be a, a long pause while the uh, visitor was trying to think of a polite way to phrase the question, what possible use is this? And what we discovered is if you say, this is a concept car, that it, it, it put their problems with it to rest. I don't know, you know, it worked too well. Um, deformable, deformable manipulation. Most everything we've been talking about is with respect to rigid bodies, right? There's another layer. Everybody says, oh my gosh, wait a second. We can't do anything with soft things. And soft things are very important because we want to do elder care. We want to do domestic service, you know. Um, and... Uh, you know, the idea is to keep the old people from becoming rigid bodies. So, you, sorry. <laughs> okay. That's the first time I ever tried that, and uh, I, will, I will never do it again, I promise. Uh, and I didn't want to, I, I was going to show you a video, but then I realized this Ripley's thing is, is better. This is um, a suction cup. So this is the arm here, and I don't believe the Ripley's readers could possibly have understood what they were looking at, but... Um, this is a piece of paper that it's folding up. This is a suction cup. So, uh, and, and this crevice right here is a vise that clamps the paper down to basically crease the fold. And the way this thing would work is it would pick the paper up and place it over the vise. And then this blade thing would push the paper down into the vise. And then the vise would crimp it. And then the blade would come and push it cross either that way or that way, and then grab it again to do the next fold. So, uh, um, of course, you know, this is, again, a biased sample of, of research. Uh, other people did deformable manipulation. Uh, 
Ken, I think at this point you've probably already done your deform closure work. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. Um, and some of you in the room probably worked on towel folding, which is, uh, I mean, Peter, I, I know for sure. But <laughs> um, anyway, so there's a lot of um, work going on. So here's the thing, right? We keep going on and on, adding more and more layers. You can always think of something else. You can always think of something else, right? It doesn't end. It's completely open-ended. How far have we gotten? How far do we have to go, right? How big is the onion? Uh, well, first off, you know, okay, it's an infinite series, but what does it sum to? Like, let's suppose we're trying to measure progress down the roadmap, right? If this is like 50%, and this is like 25, and then this is 12, and then this is 6, and this is 3, and that's 2, and et cetera, we're not doing too badly, right? Even if it is open-ended, it doesn't matter. If this is like 3%, and this is like 2.9, <laughs> and this is 2, and this is 1.5, you know, then we're doing really badly, and it's going to take us forever, you know, to, to converge to being able to, to do elder care or whatever, you know, or domestic service robotics. So which is it? How could you possibly decide? Okay, here's an idea. Boy, I thought I would be through this faster. Okay, I'm going to speed up. Okay, I heard somebody say that once in a talk. It was a really bad idea. I'm not going to speed up. I'm going to truncate if necessary. Um, here's an idea. Let's take a random sample of human manipulation. We'll just, you know, humans are not, you know, not the ultimate, I hope. But they're kind of a gold standard. They seem to be better manipulators than anything else around. So let's take a random sample of human manipulation and let's see how much of this do we see in that random sample. Okay? So um, where do we get this random sample? Uh, my, my best idea ever. Cooking shows have been shooting close-up video of humans doing great stuff with their hands forever, right? And so my random sample was I'll go to the first cooking show, the first season, the first episode, the first 10 seconds. Um, this is Julia Child. <laughs> As we get awfully tired of just baked, boiled, and mashed, and fried potatoes, well, if you do, tune in on us. We're doing... Okay. Uh, my apologies, first off. I've been using this video in talks for like, you know, five years, I guess. So some of you, I'm sure, have seen it, and I'm sorry for that. But uh, um, Actually, the first time I started this, I watched for 30 minutes. I didn't see anything. I'm just looking at somebody cooking, and I already know how to do these things kind of, not as well as her, but you know, I didn't see anything. I, I'm not learning anything. I've got to start over, maybe take notes or something. If I started over, I still didn't learn anything. Then I started looking at it one frame at a time, and... Uh, a, a world opened up. It's amazing how much you see when you look at it a frame at a time. Uh, so let's just start at the very beginning. Um, so the first thing you see, hang on. Ah, Matt, i got to figure out how to operate this thing. Oops. <laughs> oh, no, this is not going to do the right thing. Okay. It works this morning, I swear. Um, there we go. Okay, that's a frame forward. If you look at this a frame at a time right now, you might notice she, her hand is moving up, and the angle of the knife on the potato is moving. And I saw this, and to me this felt familiar. All of a sudden I'm like, Oh, she's about to cut through this knife, and the first thing she does is she sort of does that. Now, I still don't know why, okay? You feel like it's giving you some leverage, or maybe you're bracing your muscles. I don't know why, but you see there's something going on there. Um, and it seems familiar. Now, uh, let me s stop it there, and the knife plunges through, and look at the next thing that happens. One more frame. I mean, from one frame to the next, the potato is falling away from the knife. And you might notice that the knife has rotated slightly away 
from the other half of a potato. So what's going on there? One frame is not a very long time. Is she developing some torque about the axis of the knife as it plunges through the potato? So that when the potato is cleaved, is that the right word? Uh, it instantly tips away. Is that why the potato falls off of the knife? Because I don't know about you, but when I do it, the potato sticks to the knife, and then when you do the next cut, it rolls off on the floor, <laughs> right? So again, I don't know. You know, these are, but but you can see there's a lot going on here, right? In just a few seconds, there's a lot going on. Let me ask you this. So we talked about pick-and-place manipulation and sort of the primary role of grasp. You grasp things, you rigidly affix them to the hand, and then you move the hand, and that's how you move things around, okay? How many, so she, she, she manipulated 42 or 43 things here. One potato, two halves of a potato, 40 pieces of a potato, and a knife, right? So I made 44 or something like that. How many times did you see her in this video grasp something? I mean, she's holding the knife right now. It was already in her hand when the thing started. So, you know, the knife, obviously she picked it up at some point. So maybe that's one, right? Uh, well, let me ask you the next question. There comes a point now where she's about to flip a piece of potato over with her fingers like that. Where is the knife when she does that? Because she's using the, all these fingers. Okay, the answer is the knife is, is here. It's in a combination grasp. She doesn't want to take the time to put the knife down and pick it back up. Okay, so she just kind of parks it. And once you've seen this, you will see it all the time. Okay, you do it all the time. We all do it. If you watch somebody use a wrench, They'll mess around with the bolt, the nut, you know, with their uh, fingers, and then they'll use the wrench, fingers, wrench, fingers, wrench. That wrench is flipping back and forth between this, this grasp and that grasp, you know, in fractions of a second, over and over again. It's, it's, uh, it's stunning. And, and, and being able to change grasps like that is essentially unknown to us, almost unknown to us. Okay? So uh, I'm going to move on. Um, you know, I look at that video and I, my instant reaction is, oh my God, we don't, we don't recognize any of this. There's nothing going on here. You know, our robot's capabilities has zero overlap with this. Now, I don't think that's fair, right? There's a lot going on. I think the grasp of the knife could be analyzed using the tools that we have. Um, the, the sweeping the potatoes with the knife is a form of non-prehensile manipulation. We haven't really gotten to something quite that cool. Um, all of the motion of her arm, all of that is stuff that we can do, uh, you know, the kinematics, the dynamics, the control, all of those, you know. So I, there's, there's something there. I don't know how to measure it. For sure, though, uh, we're not converging quickly, is, it would be my conclusion. So my claim is manipulation is really, really big, okay, in that sense. And at the rate we're going, you know, we're not converging to capabilities that are competitive with that, what we saw there. And of course, we all see videos, we all produce videos all the time that, you know, that look very impressive because people extrapolate from what they see uh, in our videos. But in terms of the broad range of capabilities that you need to do something like domestic service um, in a way or competitive with humans, I, I really think we have a long way to go. Uh, what are we going to do about that? Um, I don't know. I, you know, I think machine learning is, is a good answer, and I know, I, I think a lot of people here will probably agree with me, maybe not my line of reasoning, but um, uh, a lot of us are interested in using machine learning to improve this. So um, that's, the, that's the part that I wanted to talk about and just see what you all thought about it. You know, this is kind of the motivation for my interest in machine learning and for the work that I've been doing for the last five years or so. Um, now that work is this thing which I called simple hands and then when we submitted the first paper to a journal, uh, we got totally reamed because some people think that hand means specifically something that looks more anthropomorphic. I had no idea. So if, you know, if you're offended by my using the word hand for this, then it's the Simple Grippers project. Um, the idea, I think I can get this in one slide. If you look at industrial practice, if you look at 
robots in factories, they're using these incredibly simple grippers. Usually those grippers are designed to handle just one part, okay? And, and, and the work will move from robot to robot to have like the next part added by yet another specifically designed gripper. So you have these simple grippers that are incredibly specialized. And then at the opposite end of these two dimensions, we have the human hand, uh, which is very complex, but also has uh, very broad capabilities. Now, actually, one thing I'm, I'm not saying is that if the human hand actually isn't the gold standard, okay? Uh, if you watch a human, they're always using tools, right? Your kitchen is, is just a huge, huge uh, repository of tools, right? And, uh, and so a, a human hand is not really the gold standard. It's a human plus the toolbox. But in any case, let's not worry about that right now. What some of us are, are trying to do is to be inspired by human hands and sort of work towards more complex grippers and more broadly capable grippers that way. Um, and the idea is actually to take inspiration from tools instead and to, uh, um, and to look at that. So for example, a human with chopsticks, a human with a prosthetic hook, a human with a pair of pliers, right? All these different tools that you use all of them, what you can do with one of those tools is immensely more impressive than what's going on in these factories, okay? It's not a limitation of the tools, it's a limitation of the perception and the intelligence behind them. So let's see if we can, in order to develop that perception and intelligence, let's see what we can do in this area. So we're being inspired by, um, by simple tools. If uh, you know, if that direction is anthropomorphism, then we'll call this direction tulomorphism. I studied dictionaries for half an hour. I couldn't come up with, you know, a good word, so that's that. If you have a better suggestion, I'm all ears. This is a blank slide. I wonder why. Does that mean there's a video? Ah, it's an animation. Here's the actual inspiration for our work. Uh, as far as I can tell, it has no name. You know, they show up in hardware stores and auto supply stores, and it's got no name, so we just called it the pickup tool. Uh, if you jam this thing into a pile of screws and let go of the button, it'll grasp them, okay? It turns out, you know, if, 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 if you've worked with robots, you'll think grasping is a horrible problem. If you work with this, you will think grasping is just no problem at all. It's just, it's just trivial, you know, it just works. The only problem is that it grasps an arbitrary number of things. I mean, it could even grasp zero, but you know, it grasps one, two, three, seven, whatever. And what's more, you don't know where they are, okay? So that's a problem. But um, we're going to follow the philosophy of that pickup tool. So instead of doing the traditional thing in robotics where you know where the object is and you're gonna put your fingertips exactly in the right place, we're gonna say, nah, we don't know exactly where it is. We're just gonna jam it in there and squeeze. Okay, so it's let the fingers fall where they may. And then the problem is you don't know what you got. You don't know where it is. That's okay. We'll find out afterwards, okay? So uh, uh, graspers ask questions later. That's our second little aphorism. And there's a third one, which uh, I was trying to explain this whole thing to Jeff Crinkle once, and he had the best aphorism for it. Grow up and hope, okay? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, this is our very first experiment. Um, so you can see it's, it's a simple hand. There's one motor, drives three fingers. Uh, they're coupled through springs, okay? So it's a com compliant coupling so that it can conform to the shape of the object. We have this scripted grasping motion. We thought spiraling in like that would help it penetrate the surface. Never tested that. Once something works, you don't mess with it, so. Uh, it shakes it a little bit. Again, we never tested that, it just seemed like a good idea. Um, and uh, you can see I got two there. Um, and then what we would do is hold that up to a camera and then off screen, uh, somebody is recording both the encoder data. At this point in time, we didn't have the encoders implemented, so we used human sensors, which by the way, in that picture of Ken, he was playing the role of the sensor. 
Yeah, he was a light beam in that in that picture. Anyway, so what we're doing here is we're getting uh, we're getting the data for a machine learning system. Uh, so it goes in, it does this grasping, it comes out with some indeterminate number of ob uh, objects and indeterminate poses. Here's some examples of the kind of things that you get, um, and you can see there's some regularities. It turns out when it does come out with one. It kind of tends to come out in one of these poses, either aligned with a finger or sort of aligned with two knuckles. So here's the two knuckle thing, here's the one finger thing, there's the two knuckle thing again. Uh, and that's actually the design. That was the concept, that was the chief concept of this design, is that uh, the number of stable poses will be small, uh, even uh, in the ideal case, it would be a finite number of stable poses. And if you have a finite number of stable poses, you can discriminate them with just a single sensor. We're actually going to use three sensors, but uh, that's the key idea. So uh, uh, now the first problem is you don't know whether you got one or two or three or zero. Okay? And so what you're looking at here is we did a bunch of experiments. We plotted the data. This is in encoder space. Okay, so finger one, finger two, finger three. Uh, plot all these data points in the encoder space. They're labeled. The ones we're after are the ones that say one marker. And then we used, uh, you know, maybe the most straightforward machine learning technique. Uh, uh, doesn't say it here. Support vector machine uh, to um, construct this decision boundary. Okay. And... Um, this was just our first experiment. These numbers actually got quite a bit better. But in a sense, it doesn't matter. Uh, exact, I mean, it does matter how accurate it is, but it depends on the task, right? Uh, is 92.9% a good accuracy for determining whether or not you got a single marker? Well, it depends on the whole task, right? Um, is 8.4 degrees error in estimating the angle of the, is that a good number or not? Depends on the task. So um, at that point, I'm uh, kind of skipping ahead here a little bit. You can see we went through several hand designs. Um, I'm going to show you uh, uh, a later video. So now we're like, OK, looking at accuracy data is not the most important thing, because uh, what's the task? We should be looking at, can you do tasks or not? In particular, can it place a marker on that little stage, that little aluminum stage right there? And um, so uh, uh, I'm going to stick, skip some details about how it's done. Um, we're doing it without vision, okay? but there are cameras there to get the data for learning and then to get the ground truth for testing our results. Okay, so this is a later model hand. You can see it's got the same <laughs> spiraling in motion. In this case, it came up with one marker, and, uh, and it showed it to the grasp camera. Uh, so we'll have ground truth on how many markers it got and where they are. And then it's going through this little scripted placing motion. It's scripted except there are a few parameters. And it's, it's, it's learning the best parameters for that little placing motion. And what it learned actually is, uh, is surprising. Okay, It learned parameters that you would not have chosen. I don't know if it looked to you, like, that was a poor choice. Okay. I would never have programmed a robot to do it that way. But uh, what it learned was, based on the data it had, the best way to do it. I think this one might be even more surprising. Look at the weird angle there, and then look at how, in that vertical motion, the sliding along the fingers straightens it out. Now, I wouldn't have thought of that. I wouldn't have done it. It looks insanely stupid, okay? But actually, the accuracy with which that hand is oriented is not nearly as great as the accuracy with which that robot will make a vertical motion. So there might actually be some uh, sense to that. And then, uh, you know, here's a, a, nice, uh, <laughs> a nice failure case, right? Breaks all the assumptions. Definitely, it's never going to win on that one. So... Um, Okay, so 
we're past, you know, we've got grasping, we've got perception, how many markers are in the hand, uh, estimation of the pose in the hand, uh, we've got control. I mean, these are sim very simple tasks, you know, it's not putting an iPhone together, but... Uh, um, but the last challenge, and I think the most interesting one, is this. Can you do in-hand manipulation? So you remember the dexterous manipulation idea is uh, that you could do things by treating this as a kinematic linkage. And you would need nine motors in your hand to do this at least the way uh, it's most commonly conceived. But if you watch a human being, of course, they do all kinds of things, many different ways. Uh, involving sometimes more motors, but often less motors. So, for example, if you pull your phone from your pocket, I bought this phone two days ago, okay? Uh, you pull your phone from your pocket and it's upside down, what do you do? I'm holding it like that, right? I can just do that. It's really easy. You know, essentially I dropped it, but I dropped it just in one dimension, not in all six dimensions, okay? Uh, or if it was like that, you had it like that, you would do that. So you're using the momentum, right? It's the dynamic manipulation thing again, but specifically applied to change of grasp. And change of grasp, I think, is really important. Um, this is the um, Kutkowski and Wright grasp taxonomy, which is, I, I would guess, the most cited grasp taxonomy that uh, anybody's uh, uh, proposed. And uh, there are many hands that have been designed to mimic the grass that you see in this taxonomy and lots of work at producing the grass that you see in, taxon in this taxonomy, but almost no work in, the, uh, in how do you navigate this taxonomy. And it's very, very important because, you know, ordinarily, if you pick something up, like here's a pen. I planted it there earlier in this particular <laughs> No, I didn't, I swear. Here's this pen, and I'm going to pick it up, okay, to pick it up. It's quite constrained, right? So I pick it up, I'm going to have it like that. Well, I can't do anything with it like that, right? This is a suitable pose for picking it up. It's not a suitable pose for using it. Right now, I can't even pull the lid off because, you know, so what do you do? It's no big deal for you, right? You've got a million different ways that you can reorient this thing in your hand. So that's the idea is to have like a million different ways. I said manipulation is big. Maybe it's not a million, you know, a couple of hundred ways of navigating in the grasp taxonomy. So I'm going to show you one video, and then uh, I'm going to stop. Um, there is a sort of what we would like to have as a way of sort of navigating the taxonomy. This is uh, the video. Um, and some of these things have been demonstrated before, you know, dropping. People have demonstrated dropping before. Uh, throwing it in the air. We discovered that one accidentally. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, that's the hand. You've seen earlier versions of it. This is, I think, the most recent version of the... Uh, the manipulation lab, simple hand. Um, pushing things against an external constraint is a way that people have been manipulating, have been changing grass for a long time. Uh, David Brock did this at MIT like in 82 or 84 or something. Rolling out of the fingertips like that, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if I've seen that. Um, rolling along the ground is no big deal. Um, that's pretty common. Uh, this pivoting thing to get it from horizontal to vertical, uh, it's different and it looks not robust, but uh, uh, if, if, if the student who did this work spends the morning tuning it up, okay, it will work 50 times in a row. Now, you know, the next day, maybe it would fail 50 times in a row. After some tuning up, it would work 50 times in a row. Okay, so it's, it's, I don't know what you call that, quasi robust or something, locally robust. Uh, this is maybe the best argument that it's robust, that it can be robust. Uh, this sequence, it did this sequence 50 times in a row without failing. So it's, um, now, um, there's something very important to be said here, which is that this is scripted, right? We had a student and we said, you know, we all together, the, the, me, Alberto Rodriguez, and uh, Nikhil Shavandafel, you know, over a period of several weeks, devised all these different operations, and, and then we twisted Nikhil's arm until he made them work. Okay? And so he programmed that at a very, a very low level. What it's a demonstration of is that the simple hand, it's within the simple hand's mechanical capabilities to do that. Right? And now it's up to us to deal with the perceptual 
the control, the planning, uh, all the issues that have to do with the intelligence. So it's maybe more of a proposal. But I think, you know, it, it goes to the point of uh, that simple hands can do a lot. Anyway, that's close to on time. <laughs> Thanks.